Jonathan, you just recently made some big statements about uh, heads of oil industry, oil companies. Uh, mm. Could you speak a little bit about that, um, what those statements were, and uh, and a little bit more about where they came from? Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting time for the chief executives and the boards of directors for big oil companies because at different points in their history they've thought very seriously about becoming what were called integrated energy companies, not just doing oil and gas but doing renewables, efficiency, whatever else it might be. And those moments have come at different points in the history but unfortunately they've never really fulfilled on that promise of becoming more than just an oil and gas company. And right now, the difficulty is they can't do that now. They're trapped in a really vicious position where they have to go on proving to shareholders that they can develop new resources, hydrocarbon resources, every year. That's the only promise they make to their shareholders, that they're always adding to their list of new assets and discoveries and developments and so on. And all that means is that all their available capital goes into developing new hydrocarbon assets, which can never be developed if we're going to avoid runaway climate change. So it's a kind of horrible trap in a way and exposes them to, I think, quite proper accusations about massive irresponsibility with their fiduciary duty and some moral questions about what that actually means for them as individuals. On the topic of Total, uh, it's a major shareholder, majority shareholder in Sun Power. Um, what do you think about that investment and that company? Uh, is it just a drop in the pond? Is it something more? Over the last 10 years or so, uh, most of the oil majors have said that if things get to a stage where they see the world of oil, coal and gas investment declining, they will acquire what they need in the world of investments. ExxonMobil was always the company that exemplified this particular position. They argued that we're not too worried, we'll do oil and gas until it's not acceptable, we're the best in that field, and when it becomes unacceptable, we'll buy whatever we need in the world of renewables. So there has always been this fallback position that they can kind of invest their way in extremists into the world of renewables. So Total is probably now, of all the oil majors, most aggressively out there in the market trying to increase its portfolio around renewables, probably. Um, I heard talk just around the margins of the discussions here at the World Future Energy Summit that both Shell and BP are looking again now at major renewable plays. I Was know. it in response to you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> But you're bound to see this kind of stuff. And I think the shareholders, my feeling is now that shareholders may be rather more demanding of those boards of directors in oil majors, saying actually diversification is a smart move from a shareholder perspective. Because if you leave us completely exposed to the risk of stranded assets, frankly, it's our money that you're playing with. Because that value that you are likely to destroy will obviously bite us. It'll destroy our holding in this company. I think we may see more pressure from shareholders, institutional shareholders indeed. And I was just going to start with that one question, but uh, what do you think about this divestment movement? Uh, what do you, where do you think it can go? What do you think it can accomplish? I think that one of the key parts of the climate change movement now is the divestment story. Growing pressure mm -hmm. on financial institutions, universities, other organizations around the world, charitable foundations for instance, to pull out of their holdings in oil and gas companies. And it's having quite an impact. The actual scale of divestment, if you look at it in terms of the monetary quantum, the amount of money is pretty small. But the symbolic value is enormous because it's opening up this whole question mark uh, with right at the heart of today's capital markets about what level of risk are we now exposed to? So the amount of value at risk. And if we can't trust that source of value indefinitely into the future, where do we find the alternative source of value for people seeking to look after their pension fund, whatever it might be? So the discussions going on are much greater, much more significant than the actual level of divestment that has happened so far. But this will grow. This will definitely grow. Right now, uh, so you're on the, you're on a, 
committee of the Zayed Future Energy Prize, and you've been quite involved here for a while. Uh, I've been here for a few years in a row now, several times. Um, the Mazdar Corporation is, to me, very inspiring, but you have statements on every, from every angle about what it is, yeah. what it's supposed to do, what the, accom- what the accomplishments should be, what the highest level people in Abu Dhabi, in the UAE, are interested in, mm. and what they think about these matters. Okay. I've been on the selection committee for the Zayed Future Energy Prize from the start, and it has been a source of incredible inspiration, actually. I think that it's demonstrated that a country that is still dependent on oil and gas for a significant part of its revenues is able to think longer term about what its future will mean. The prize is one part of that. Mazda is obviously another very important part of that. Not just the Mazda City, of course, but Mazda Institute which has helped to create lots of brilliant new thinking around many of these more renewable, sustainable technologies. And the fund itself, the Mazda Fund, which of course is invested around the world in many very important renewable energy schemes. So it's, it is a really good model, and one can't help but notice now around the GCC, the, the Gulf countries, that this is a model that has definitely taken on in, has been taken up in other countries. And getting I'm a lot of attention. Getting a lot of attention. Mm-hmm. And therefore it's had this knock-on effect, which I think is brilliant. Well, the, the, the picture that, the, that for me captures it the best is that it seems like the UAE is sort of trying to create a Silicon Valley of clean tech. Mm. You can't monopolize clean tech like you can monopolize <laughs> oil and gas. But it seems like they're trying to do the best they can to make the future of the clean tech economy centered very yeah. much here. Do you think that's a... I do, and I think it's a, it makes sense. On the other hand, you're right. The level of investment now in cutting-edge clean tech is so enormous globally that no one country will ever be able to command that degree of market share. I think that Mazda has got the intention to be a real leader in that field. And by virtue of that contribution, set the pace for others.